Well, hello, everyone. I'm Pastor Sabrina, and with me is... Pastor Zach. And we're excited that you guys have decided to join us for our digital service today. If it's one of your first times here, you're new, we would love for you to look in the description box down below and fill out our Connect card. And that's just really going to help us get to know you guys a little bit better. Another thing that we're super excited for is the possibility of meeting in person again soon. Obviously, number one thing about this is that we want to follow CDC guidelines and restrictions on things. So the thing that we need to implement that is absolutely essential before we can even think about meeting in person is our safety and our cleaning team. So if you're someone who likes to clean, which Zach loves to clean. <laughs> oh boy, it's my favorite. <laughs> or if you're someone who just really wants to be back in this space and is gonna do anything they can to be together with each other, we need this team to grow. So if you're interested in being a part of the safety and cleaning team, please email us at blc at Branchline Church so that we can get you guys connected there. Yeah, please let us know if you'd like to be a part of this team because like Pastor Sabrina said, it's essential if we want to open our doors again to have everyone back in our building. Mm -hmm. Now this morning, we also want to give everyone a chance, the opportunity rather, to give. And there's four different ways you can give. Online, via text, through the app, as well as through a check in the mail. And we just want you to know that every dollar, every dime that's given goes to the mission that God has given this church, which is to connect people to a growing relationship with Jesus. And one of the ways that we do that is through our student and kids ministries. And so when it comes to impact, we've been continuing our weekly Zoom events from our awesome Wednesday nights to our game days. In the last two weeks, we've continued our scavenger hunt. And two weeks ago, Samuel won. Woo! And then this past week, Taylor won. So congratulations <laughs> to both of them. Well done, guys. So glad that you were able to make it out and hope to see many more of you in the upcoming weeks. And so if you want to know what's happening, give us a follow on Instagram at ImpactBLC. Yeah. And also, if you want to know what's going on in B-Kids, you can follow us on Instagram as well at BKidsBLC to get any updates or announcements there. We are starting a brand new series in B-Kids Digital Service today. I'm very excited about it, but we're going to keep it a secret for now. Ah. The kiddos are the only ones that get to know. Uh, so kids, go grab some papers, some crayons, something to write with, because uh, we're going to get started really soon here. Yeah. And that link will be right in the description below. And now this week, we also want to continue to encourage you. If you've been missing some people and you feel safe gathering, we've been encouraging watch parties at homes where you can share a meal, watch the Sunday service together, and then talk about it afterwards. So encourage you whether or not you're looking for a group or you would love to host someone um, we can help get the word out if you're looking to have people over. Yeah. We're going to continue on with worship today with Pastor Ian.
And all 
the peace that comes when I'm broken and undone by your unfailing grace I can lift my voice and sing you can Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours You can have it all, Lord Every part of my world Life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. There is no greater call than giving you my all. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. There is no greater love, no higher name above. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. There is no greater call. Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours Well, hi everyone. Welcome to Branch Line Church. For those of you that don't know, my name is Joe Hanna. And I have the privilege to lead this great church alongside of many others. While my wife and I were raising our children, there would be moments where we would pause and we would have a family meeting. And the main reason why we would do that was there was either conflict, confusion, or really big news. And the reason why we would have a, a family meeting is we wanted to bring us all together and be on the same page. We knew that unity and togetherness was vital for us. And so we would be intentional 
In fact, sometimes we would be direct with our children because we knew that it was worth it. And so I want to lead out by just having a family meeting with all of you. I know this may be your first time checking in on Branchline or Branchline at Branchline Church, and that's okay. Just watch in. But I, I, I want to just have a family meeting with all of you, just speak to you from my heart. First off, I want to lead out and just say, I miss you guys. I love you. And I know, I know that all of you, we all want to come back together in person and worship. But I want you to know something, that your leadership, the leadership of the church, your pastors, have been prayerfully and diligently laying out a plan for all of us to come back together. And you've seen that as that's come out this week, and we are excited about what that looks like. But until that moment, I want to encourage us as a church to continue to be the church. Let's never forget that the church is not the building. We are the church. And as Jesus' church, we are called to a mission, and that is to connect people to a growing relationship with Jesus. And that means we're going to continue to love people. What does that look like? It looks like we're going to love people. We're going to love people and we're going to be safe. And that means we're going to practice social distancing. We're going to do that because we love people. Why did we stop meeting? Why did we stop coming together back in person? Because we love people. We love people. And we're willing to do whatever it takes to stay safe. And so I want to remind us that we still have a mission, and that is to connect people to a growing relationship with Jesus. And that means we love people. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to continue to share, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want us to own the words of the Apostle Paul, where he's like, listen, let's become all things for all people so that God can save many. And that means if you and I have to wear a mask, If you and I have to social distance, if you and I can't give hugs, if we can't give high fives, if we can't shake hands, then we're willing to do that to reach people for Jesus Christ, to help others know the love that we know, the grace that we know, the mercy that we know, and to enter into and to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And so we're going to love people. We're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're also going to prayerfully follow a plan prayerfully follow a plan. And I want to just talk to us about this building, about us coming back together in person. I want to remind us that this building is not the hub. This building is not the hub. What the hub, our hub is, what we have in common is Jesus. And the reason why people want to be part of our family, Branch Line Church, is not because they want to meet us. It's not because they want us. They want Jesus. They want, they want something greater than themselves. They want that thing to fill that void inside of them. And the only one that can do that is Jesus. And so I just want to remind us. Remember, I always remember, we need to be reminded more than we are need to be instructed. And I want to remind us that this building, us coming together in person, that is not the hub. The hub is Jesus. Everything we do is founded on Jesus. He is what we're united around, and he is what we're going to build this church on, not this building. The other thing I want to ask you to do, I want to encourage us to do, is to stop asking the question, what is the church doing Let's stop asking that question. Why? Because when we refer to church, we're referring to a blob. We're referring to a building. We're referring to an organization. No, let's stop asking what the church is doing and let's start asking the question, what am I doing? What am I doing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about Jesus? What am I doing to bring hope to hopelessness? What am I doing to support others, care for others? What am I doing? And I believe that if we all start asking that question, stop asking what is the church doing, and start asking the question, what am I doing? If we individually do that, one by one, we will watch our community be transformed by Jesus, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that with every ounce of my being, not only in our community, but our community and beyond. And so let's start asking the question, what am I doing? 
to advance the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so again, I just wanted to take a brief moment and have a family meeting because I believe that if we are united, if we are together, as we walk into our new normal, there is no stopping Jesus' church. And so again, I pray that this is worth it for you, that we are united and we are all on the same page, that we're going to love others, we're going to stay safe, we're going to continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're going to prayerfully follow a plan. Would you join me in prayer before we get into the word this morning? Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be your church. That Jesus, this is your church. We are your church. We are your people. And we are so happy that we belong to you. That our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and it can never be erased. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for our salvation. And sir, right now, we ask that you would check our hearts, that you would check the motivation of our hearts, that you would help us right now, that we would be desperate for you, wanting your word, wanting what you would have to say to us so that we can look at our future and have hope, that we can be expectant and believe that you have a plan and purpose for us as individuals and as a church. And then, sir, as a minister of your gospel, as someone who proclaims your word, I pray that you would get me out of the way, that you would help me just stand in your presence and do what I'm about to do for an audience of one. In Jesus' name, we pray as a church, amen. So we're going to continue our series titled Eyes Wide Open where we're walking into the life of Job. We're focusing on one verse, Job 42, verse 5, where Job says this, My ears have heard of you, like I've known facts about you, but now I've seen you. And what God is trying to help us discover in this series, Eyes Wide Open, is that when life seems to be falling apart, whether it's falling apart or seems to be falling apart, you and I, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to see God more clearer than we ever have. And God wants, he wants to take this moment in our life and he wants to open up our eyes to who he is, what he's done, and what he's able to do in our life. And when when we allow God to open up our eyes, we begin to make this transition. And see if you can relate with this. Maybe this has already happened in your life, but maybe it's still coming. But you begin to uh, make this transition where you are focused on the past, you're grieving what was, and you make this transition, you start focusing on the future. Like when your eyes are open to who God is and what he's able to do, now you start looking at the future and you have hope. Like you're expectant about the future. Like God has a plan and purpose, not only for you, for me, but for his church. Jesus' Jesus' church is not done yet. And so God wants to open up our eyes to who he is. He wants to be known. He truly does. He wants to be known. He doesn't want us just to know facts about him. He wants us to know him, to walk through life with him. And so last week we turned to Job and we answered the question, God, are you in control? Are you in control? We learned that there is the presence of good and evil. We know that in our life. And evil and Satan have to submit to the sovereignty of God. Like God is in control. And when you and I understand that, when we take that in, it immediately prompts questions like, God, then why is there suffering? Like if you're in control and Satan can't do anything unless you allowed it, allow it, why is there suffering? Why is there pain? Like, God, do you care? Do you care about our situation? And so there's a description of God that's used throughout the Bible, and that description is, he's noted as father. Like, what kind of father is God? And the best way I can think of it is, uh, thinking about my own life, my wife and I have raised three boys, and my boys pretty much have gone to my wife for everything. Everything in life 
end, whether, you know, they need help on their homework, they're sick, they need to be nurtured. And, and so my wife has always cared for my wife, for my kids in a, in a greater way. And so when we think about uh, what kind of father is God? He's a God who's in control, but he's also a God who cares. And so when we think about our natural families, my kids have often gone to my wife more times than not. But sometimes they come to me. Like if they want to talk about um, cars, if they want to talk about sports, talk about boats, talk about their job, they often come to their father. But they also come to me for security and protection. And we really noticed this distinction while we were raising our kids, and my wife and I slept on two opposite sides of the bed. If our kids had a nightmare, they would often come to my side of the bed, right? They need protection, they need security, and they'd come to me to pray with them and to feel secure, to feel at peace about where they're sleeping and, and their home. But if they need to be nurtured, if they need to be cared for, if they were sick, if they just needed to be cuddled, they would often go to my wife's side of the bed. And so what kind of father is God? He's a God who's in control. He's a God who is almighty. He is a powerful God. He, but he's also a compassionate, caring, tender, a God who cares. And so last week, God used Job to, to bring us into the fact that God is in control, that he's almighty, that he's all powerful. This week, God is going to use Job to bring us to the other side of the bed to mom's side of the bed, the tender side of the bed, the compassionate side of the bed. And God is going to help us answer the question, God, God, do you care? Do you care about me? Are you involved in my every day? Do you care that I'm dealing with sadness? Do you care that I'm dealing with anxiety? Do you care that I'm struggling with the loss of a potential love? Do you care about what I'm up against right now? And so last week we turned to Job 38, 39, and 40, and God answered the question, you know, where Job was asking the question, God, are you in control? And he answered that question by asking Job questions, remember? He didn't answer him, he asked, asked him more questions, and it was through answering of these questions that Job understands that God is in control. And the question such as, Job, were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Job, were you there when I laid the dimensions of the ocean and how deep the ocean and how much water would be in the ocean? Job, were you there when I, I laid out and, and determined the sunrise and the sunset? Job, were you there when I determined the vastness of the earth? Job, do you know how many snowflakes fall or how light travels? Did you know that I laid out how the Mississippi flows and how it flows into the St. and how the St. Croix flows into the Mississippi? Job, I did all of that. And, and, and by God asking those questions, he brings Job to this place where he's like, okay, I had heard of you, God, but now I see. Like, you are in control. You are sovereign. You are almighty. You are all powerful. And so through those questions, God makes this awesome transition, this transition from talking about the vastness of the universe to he starts talking about animals. He starts talking about the birds of the air. And it's really, really fun when he makes this transition because it helps you see that God is not only in control, but he also is a God who cares, a God who's tender. Job 38, 41 it says this, who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Job 40, 1 through 2, do you know when the mountain goats give, mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? Job, did you clothe the horse with its wonderful and, and ma its mane? Did you do that? Did you give the eagle its sight? Its sight that helps them find and provide for their families, that helps them find their nest and build their nest? And so God makes this transition from not just being a cosmic creator, but he's also a caring, tender, and compassionate father. Job listens to God talk about the raven, Talk about the strength and the beauty of the horse. Talk about the eyesight of the eagle. 
And while he's asking these questions, there's just something comforting about these questions. Because you and I come to understand through these questions that God cares. He cares. He cares about us. He answers the question, do you care, God? Why is this important? Because there are people out there that that believe in deism. Deism is where God started the earth, created the earth, got the engine moving. Uh, He got the earth orbiting a thousand miles an hour on its axis. And then he just stepped away from it. Like it just sits back and drinks tea. And in a way, we're like a Netflix show. Entertaining him. Entertaining God. And he just sits back and he's removed. Not part of what we're doing. And this is how a lot of people justify suffering and pain. Like, God, God just created all that we know and he's not interacting with our creation and he's just allowing suffering and pain to happen. But that's not true. That's not what we read in the Bible. God is not, he didn't just get the earth spinning. No, he's intimately involved. He's connected. He's tender. He's compassionate. He cares about all that you and I do in our life. And so what I want to do is I want to turn to the animals. I want us to talk to the animals. I don't know if you talk to your animal. I talk to my pet. I'm crazy. Most of us do though. But I want us to talk to the animals. And where do I get that idea? If you could open up your Bible to Job chapter 12, where God uses Job to prompt us to talk to the animals. He's like the animals talk to us. They reveal to us that God cares. And so Job chapter 12, 7 through 10, it says this, But ask the animals, and they will teach you, or the birds of the, in the sky, and they will tell you, speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all of these does not know? He's like, they all know that the hand of the Lord has done all of this. All of this, the Milky Way, the universe, the earth, you and I, God's done all of this. And then verse 10, like man, if you could camp on this verse all week, if you could memorize this verse, it's so good. In his hand, like in his hand, he's got the whole world in his hands. Like in his hands is the life of every creature and the breath of of all mankind. God uses Job to help us see, like, listen, if you would ask the animals, if you'd turn to nature, if you would turn to my creation, I promise you, you will see that I care. And so what I want to do is just take a few moments and just turn to a couple birds, animals, God's creation, and talk to them. So let's turn to the woodpecker. Let's ask the question, God, do you care? Let's turn to the woodpecker. We know that the woodpecker, it is, it is able to peck at a tree like 15 times in one minute. And what's crazy is, it is pecking at the speed of a bullet. And so people, scientists have studied their beak and the cushion, like this this thing that goes in between their beak and their brain, they're trying to like multiply it or create it ourself and they can't come up with it. But God out of his care created this substance in between the beak and the brain of the woodpecker that gives them the ability to provide for themselves and gives them the ability to create a nest. Telling you and I, the woodpecker is speaking to you and I, answering the question like, yes, God cares for you. He is is involved in your life. Let's talk about the honeybee. Honeybee, for a brief moment, you and I know that the honeybee, it goes out and it finds pollen and brings it back to the beehive. But we've all been asking the question, well, like, how do they know if a beehive runs into, like, a ton of pollen, how do they tell the other bees that there's a truckload of pollen out there, there's a treasure out there? What we know is they don't talk. And so they can't say, well, it's a mile down the road, take a left, and it's on Walnut Street. They can't do that. Uh, What they do, what God gave honeybees the ability to do is dance. Yeah, they dance. And so God, out of his care for the honeybee, gave them the ability to dance. And so honeybees dance, and by them dancing a certain dance, gives directions to the other honeybees. 
It blows my mind. And so again, if we allow the honeybees to speak to us, we see that God cares for us. Another, pers- another uh, bird to ask is the pigeon. Like Pigeons fly miles and miles without a GPS system. And if we were to study bird after bird, let's just take, for instance, the Arctic tern. They fly 2,500 miles and they never get lost. Why is that? Well, what scientists have discovered is that God, out of his care for these birds, almost all birds, all birds actually, they have like this magnetic field in them. It's in, it's, they're born with a GPS system. It blows my mind. And so when you really study and ask birds and talk to them and just allow them to talk to you, don't talk to animals, but just allow them to talk to you, you see that God cares deeply for us. And what I love about it, when you and I study an artist, or when we study what an artist does, we learn a lot about that artist. And so when you and I look at the creation, we learn a lot about the creator. And creation tells us, we learned last week, that God is mighty, that he's all-powerful, that he's in control. But it also tells us, when we allow God's creation to talk to us, that God is tender, he's compassionate, that he cares. And so Job, he has a truckload of questions, and so on. You, so do you and I. But God, what's crazy is he doesn't need to answer our questions. He doesn't need to. So what he does is he flips it around on us, and he starts asking us questions to get us to understand that he's in control and that he cares. And so here's your question that God wants all of you to answer. He wants me to answer, and that question is, do you believe that God cares? Like, do you believe that God cares? Like, let let that set in. Like, when you think about your prayer life, when you think about sitting in your favorite chair, when you think about all of your life, your circumstance, your situation, your relationships, do you believe that God cares for you? Let me me give you an image for a brief moment. Let's say you had a three-year-old daughter. Three-year-old daughter, and you knew that you had to get vaccines for her. You had to get shots for her. And you brought her into the doctor, and I've had this happen. My son Dominic hated shots, and so my wife, she's an RN, and, and he had to get four shots at one time. Maybe it was three, I don't remember. But my, my, my son hated shots, so what my wife did is she said, hey, could you bring in a couple nurses so they can do it all at once? Because my son, once he feels that pain, he's not going to want to go through it again. And so they brought in the nurses, and they, boom, gave him the shot, and so he went through it. But if you had a three-year-old daughter, And she knew that that shot was going to create pain. And she asked you the question, Daddy, Mommy, why why am I getting a shot? And you answered that question. You you just laid it out in front of her. What we know about a three-year-old is that she's not going to understand. She's not going to understand why you were giving her the shot. And so the only thing we can do to help her understand that you care for her, even though you're putting her through this pain, you can describe to her till you're blue in the face, like you need to do this to stay healthy, to prepare you for the future so that you can go out in public. Like you need to do this. You could explain that, but she'll never understand. And so the way that you and I help would help her understand is you go home and open up the closet and you'd ask her a question, what's that blanket for? And she would come back and say to you, what's to keep me warm? Mommy and Daddy. Then you go to the pantry, you'd open it up, and you'd point her to the food, and it's like, what's the food for? And she would say, well, that's so I can eat, and so I'd never get hungry. And then you'd bring her to the medicine cabinet, and you'd ask her, well, what's this medicine for? And she would say, well, that medicine's so that I can stay healthy. And then you'd point her to all the dates on the medicine bottles to prove to her that you care. And that's exactly what God does for Job. And that's exactly what God wants to do for you and for me. He wants us to turn to his creation, the birds of the air, because what we learn from Jesus is that God cares more about us than the birds of the air, more about us than the animals that he's created. All of creation, he cares more about us. And so we got to ask the question, well, why did Job need his eyes open to this? Why did he need his eyes open to the fact that God cared for him? And again, we got to turn to Job chapter 1, and we learn that Job 
owned 7,000 sheep. This is verse 3. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Now, I don't know how this transfers financially to our situation today, but I'm letting you know this guy was comfortable. He was able to look at his future, and he's like, I'm set, I'm good. And then we know that the bottom drops out. He loses his job, he loses his finances, he loses his certainty for his future. Even his wife is talking, like, just curse Cursed God, his friends are coming after him. He's lost his kids. And that brings us to Job chapter 42, verse 5. Job's like, listen, in chapter 1, when I had everything, when I was comfortable, when I was able to look at my future and there was certainty, I mean some certainty, that it was kind of known. When I, when I was in chapter 1, God, I had heard about you. My ears had heard about you. But now, now that I'm in need, like now that I'm desperate, now that I've lost everything, now that the bottom has fallen out, now that I am feeling like life is falling apart, now my eyes have seen you. Like now I know you are in control. Now I know that you care. And I'll bring that up because isn't it interesting that it is that you and I often have to reach a place where we see our need in order to see God. Like we need to see our need first in order for us to see God. And that brings me One more animal. I want to talk to you about one more bird. And this bird is called the golden plover. The golden plover is interesting because it's a very small bird. It's about as small as a a blade of grass. And it flies 2,500 miles without taking a rest. And that's 88 hours, 88 flight hours without taking a rest. And so scientists, they've looked at this. They've studied this, and they're like, they've laid it out math- mathematically on paper, and they're like, this isn't physically possible. You take the size of the bird and the amount of fuel that it would take to fly 88 hours, and it's just not possible. And yet they know that the plover, the golden plover, makes it the 2,500 miles every single time. And so they know That mathematically, when they lay it out, it's not possible, and yet they know that they do it every single time. So now I want you to think about our God, our God who's in control. I want you to think about the God of the golden plover. And here's what I know. I know some of you right now, you're tired. I know you're consumed by thoughts like, I'm not sure I'm going to make this. Like, you can't can't see the 2,500-mile mark. You're flying in the air, you're over oceans, you're over the unknown, you're over the uncertainty right now, and you have no idea how you're going to make it. You're like 81%, I'm not even going to make it to 81%. You've done the math, it doesn't make sense. You wake up every day, you keep going, but you're exhausted. You're exhausted. Like you started COVID-19 and you're like, I got this, but it's been going on for a while now. And you're tired. Like you're ticking at the 70% and you're like, there's no way I'm going to make 81%. And this is what God wants to help you see. He wants you to know that in that weakness, as you are exhausted, as you're tired, as you're fretting over life and you're overwhelmed and you feel like you can't go any further, it is the greatest opportunity to see God in a clear way. It is the greatest opportunity for you to make a transition to knowing facts about God, to you knowing God, to you getting on your knees, to you coming to God in such desperate need. It is so funny to me, we often have to see our need in order for us to see our God. And so often we have to see that God is not only nice, he's not just nice, but he is necessary He's necessary, but often we need to reach this moment where we are desperate for God, where we need him so much. And David, he puts it this way. If you're there, this is what God wants us to know. He cares. He's tender. He's compassionate. The Lord is close. He's close. He's right there. His hand is right there. He wants you to reach out, grab his hand, walk through life with him. He's close. 
to the brokenhearted. He's close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Like if you are at that 70, if you're at that 81, you don't know how you're going to make it. God is close and he saves those of us who are crushed in spirit. And then 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him. And this is a promise. Why? Because he cares for you. He's able. His shoulders are broad enough. The question that you and I have to answer is, do we believe that he cares? Do we believe that his shoulders are broad enough? Do we believe that he's intimately connected to our life? Do we believe that he cares about our mortgage, that he cares about our marriage, that he cares about our children, that he cares about all of the details of our life? Do we believe that? And if you're struggling with that, I want to encourage you, inspire you, to open up the Bible. Open up your Bible. Like if you want to know more of God, you know about know more about God. Like if you want to know God intimately, if you want him to ask you questions that will help you understand that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he's tender, that he's compassionate, that he wants you to crawl up on his knee, turn to Job chapter 39. Let God ask you some questions. And above and beyond that, take some time. Sit out in your favorite chair, favorite lawn chair. Observe God's creation. All nation, all all nature. Allow, take it in. Allow them to speak to you. Allow the birds to speak to you about how God cares for them and God also cares for you deeply. If you struggle beyond that, I don't know how many of you have put a tattoo on your body of the cross. I don't know how many of you carry around your neck the cross of Jesus Christ. But this cross, it symbolizes the fact that God cares for you. He loves you. In fact, it symbolizes that Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And so if you're at 70, if you're at 81% of this journey that you're on, I want you to know that when you turn to Jesus, when you turn to Jesus and grab his hand, I promise you he will give you the strength to push through whatever you're going through. He will give you the perseverance to push through a broken relationship. He'll give you the strength to go back to a relationship that you need to go back to and find restoration and reconciliation. He will give you peace about your job situation. He'll give you joy in the midst of a financial, really ugly financial situation. He will give you the ability to go to a whole new level at work. He'll inspire you to want to dig deeper again in your career. Jesus This is a symbol that God cares about every area of your life. He will give you the strength to help your son or daughter through addiction. He will give you whatever you need. Why? Because he cares for you. See, Jesus knew that we couldn't span the gap between us and God because of our sin. Like there was nothing you and I could do about our sin. There was nothing you and I could do to satisfy God's wrath. Nothing. The whole Old Testament tells us that. And so Jesus came to do what you and I can't do. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, for God so cares about the world, that he sent his one and only Son to die for our sin, to do what you and I could never do. And when you and I put our faith in Jesus put our faith in the fact that Jesus came to this earth, died, was crucified on this cross, died, was buried, resurrected from the grave. That's why this cross is empty, because our Savior is alive. When you and I put our faith in that, when we believe in that, John 3.16 says that you and I enter, enter into an eternal relationship with a God who is in control, with a God who, yes, Satan is out there. Yes, bad things happen. Yes, there's evil. But they can do nothing without God's permission. He's in control. And that is the God that you're going to spend eternity with. 
but not just eternity with, but here on earth. Like he's going to care for you while you're on this earth, eternal life from this point and on. And so when you and I think about our future, yes, things look like they're falling apart, but right now God wants to open up our eyes. And he's not done with us yet. He's not done with us yet. He cares too much, not only about us, but about everybody. And he wants other people to know the love that we know, the grace that we know, the mercy that we know, the Jesus that we know, our hub, that he is the one that unites us, that brings us together, that creates us, and gives us a sense of belonging and creates in us a, a family, a family. We're, we're the children of the most high God, a family of God. Like Jesus' blood runs through our veins. The Holy Spirit is in us. That means we have access to God's power and authority. And so if you're struggling with the question, God, do you care for me? I want you to turn to the symbol that represents God's love and his care for you. And this symbol will give us hope for our future. This symbol will make us expectant for what's next. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the fact that you take characters out of the Bible and you help us step into their life and then help us apply it to ours. And God, we're asking that over this next week that you give us, that you prompt us to get in your word, to have, give you an opportunity to ask us questions, to help us understand that you're in control and that you care you're tender, that you're compassionate, and that you're involved in our lives in an intimate way. We love you, Jesus. We can't imagine doing life without you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good. So next week we're going to continue our series, Eyes Wide Open. I want to encourage you to invite people to our online service. And next week is going to be the first time for us to come together in person. I want to encourage you to sign up for that. And again, if you sign up, we will be observing social distance guidelines. God bless you all. Have a great week.